think that is everything. Without further ado, I'll let you take over. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. Greetings, everyone. Uh, uh, just to, uh, to mention, uh, I'm Eric Dahlstrom, and you know, please feel free to contact me at, at my email here. And also, I, I set up, uh, you can download the charts and the presentation, and also some links to videos I use uh, in this uh, bit.ly shortcut to a Google Drive. Yes. Uh, just a note on that, uh, I tried it. And the NZ room one is case sensitive. We need to have it exactly how it's on. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Capital NZ, capital M, the one. And I also I left a little sign over here for the same information. Uh, some people uh, were expecting this starting at 6:30, so I think some people might be joining uh, a little later. Uh, that's all right. Um, so. Uh, uh, I'll introduce myself in a second, uh, but first I sort of started, wanted to start with a, a little story about my my father. Um, uh, this is back, uh, Charles Lindbergh uh, back in 1927 uh, flew flew from Paris uh, from New York to Paris and became world famous. Uh, and uh, then immediately after he came, he flew to Paris. He came back and he did a tour around the United States. In the United States, and uh, which is really crazy since this airplane has no front window, for one thing. He's flying with a periscope. Um, and, uh, uh, but my father, when my father was five years old, uh, was able to see uh, Charles Lindbergh when he came and, uh, to Minneapolis. And uh, when my father was young, he didn't think he would ever fly in an airplane, but uh, later on when he Grew up, you know, he he was uh, traveling quite a bit in airplanes, and and somehow, even though my father was flying, I still had the idea that I wasn't going to be flying around. And uh, but I think my father, my grandfather, would be really surprised to find me here in New Zealand, having moved to New Zealand and having uh, flown, I think, uh, six hundred thousand kilometers in the last ten years, and just so it, it's the, these transformations do happen. Um, uh, and they can happen. Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, hello. Can, yes. Hello. Okay. This, this this helps probably. Um, and so these transformations do happen, and some uh, very quickly sometimes. And one other area I'd like to point out: uh, when I was five, uh, my parents gave me a moon globe. It's a little rusty, and I. I immediately started playing with it, kicking it down the street and adding some craters here. Uh, only later did I realize that this was pretty special moon globe. This was 1964 moon globe, and it still had an unknown region here that humanity had never seen that part of the moon. They only got one satellite around and took one picture on this side. And uh, so when I grew up, uh, uh, people are actually, you know, uh, uh, on the Apollo program that were orbiting the moon and mapping it and landing on it. And so I don't know if I will ever go to the moon, but I'm willing to bet that some of the young people here in the audience will be, have a chance to go to the moon. And so that's what I, I'm here to talk about. Okay, um, so uh, in my, my background is, uh, I started in physics and astronomy, uh, radio astronomy and infrared astronomy, mapping the galaxy, then went into space engineering, and uh, I worked on the design of the International Space Station for eight years for NASA, and uh, also worked on how to use the space station to uh, support going to the moon. And I've been uh, teaching at International Space University, um, and also the chairman of the Space Science Department there, uh, and uh, working with uh, startup companies and some lunar startup companies, and also advising NASA on how to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to protect against asteroids hitting Earth. Um, but what we're here, uh, me and my uh, partners, my wife, 
uh, Emmeline over here, and Rich Bodo here sitting in. Um, we are part of uh, uh, an organization called Space Base. We're setting up, we just uh, got organized in New Zealand, and our mission is to help uh, New Zealanders get involved in space and create space projects. And, uh, uh, and so we're here on a three-year visa through the uh, Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Uh, our mission is to democratize space so that everyone around the world has a chance to be involved and uh, participate in this what we see as a big uh, opportunity of expansion into the solar system. So our initial projects are creating a directory of all the space activities going on in New Zealand and uh, we've also created a, uh, the first national space challenge for New Zealand. And that uh, space challenge, we have uh, people have 10 more days to submit their ideas to use space technology to help uh, navigate across Antarctica. And so go to this site to learn about the details because if your idea is considered valuable, you could win the $40,000 prize. We can, you can talk to us more about the details if you want after that. First, uh, so I'd like to talk about the moon, uh, remember some things about Apollo, talk about some of the recent discoveries, and what it would be like to actually fly to the moon, because I think uh, a lot of these uh, areas that I thought might take a century to happen may happen in five or ten years. Things are happening really fast in, in the area of the moon, uh, and a lot of people are finding opportunities to get involved. Um, first off, uh, while I'm learning, uh, since living in the southern hemisphere, I'm learning to put the north at the bottom. This <laughs> is the way the moon appears in the sky from the south. And I keep, you know, telling myself to not turn my head upside down to look at it. Um, so we have the, the near side of the moon and the far side that has finally been mapped. You never see this in the sky. We only see the, the near side uh, from Earth. And you can see that it actually looks different. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dark areas on the moon are ancient uh, lava fields. They're actually uh, uh, darker than the, than the other, the highlands over there on the other side. And so these are these flat areas are the safest places that were in the land, and that's where the first Apollo landings were happening. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, this is the size of New Zealand. Uh, and so uh, the whole air land area of the moon is about the same as the land area of Africa. So just imagining, imagine, you know, visiting uh, six places in Africa and whether or not you got a good feel for the, for the, the uh, combat. Um, so uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to mention about the, um, uh, it's often very confusing to people about the real relative scale of the orbit of the, of the moon and, to, and the earth. Um, uh, I have a, I'm uh, uh, sort of a weak Earth here, uh, and uh, so this is oh, it's really deflating already. Um, so with this Earth, and uh, I would use our my my moon is uh, about about the right size. It's a little bit large. Uh, this one's better, but it's not a moon. <laughs> um, and so. Uh, oftentimes you'll see, you know, the drawings of the moon orbiting the Earth like this. And, but on this scale, can you, uh, anybody can, uh, can anybody guess how far away this moon has to be relative to the this uh, size Earth in order to be the right scale for the orbit of the moon? Yeah. Not that, not that far. It's still within this room. 
So it's a, uh, but uh, it's basically has to be, um, what did I figure, uh, 12 meters. So it's, it's in the stacks over there. Um, and so uh, if you, let's see if I, uh, here, uh, here's the, uh, the actual uh, relative brightness of the Earth and Moon also. The Moon is very, very dark gray and the Earth is this brilliant blue, uh, blue and white. Uh, so if we think that the full Moon looks brilliant, bright from when we see it on Earth, just imagine being on the moon and seeing something 30 times brighter with the full Earth. Uh, but here's a here's a picture from a space passing spacecraft that took a picture of the true scale of Earth and Moon. And you can see how how far apart the how the moon is. So uh, the phases of the moon, uh, in in some ways, because the, the moon always locks this one side facing Earth. It's like a, a selfie stick, you know, where you're, <laughs> you're just holding this around and it's always looking at you. And, uh, uh, but if you have um, the sunlight coming from some direction, like, um, well, I, I, I don't have a bright spotlight, but uh, suppose, uh, you know, you're looking at me, you're, you're looking from the sun, then you see, uh, you know, a part of the half of the Earth, and then you you see the half of the Moon illuminated, and the phases are just because as the Moon orbits around like this, you start to see more of the bright side of the Moon. And so, um, as the Moon orbits uh, once every 27 days, uh, it moves about 13 degrees in one one day. And so, right now we're we're about four di four days since the new moon, when, we, when the, uh, the moon was in the direction of the sun, and so it's moved about 50 degrees over here, and we can just start to see a little bit of the um, uh, uh, crescent. And then uh, in, in a week and a half, it'll be uh, full on the other side of, of the Earth, right, uh, from the sun. Another thing about the moon's orbit that's unusual is that uh, while the Earth is is uh, tilted at the sun uh, 23 degrees, and that causes the seasons, uh, uh, the Moon is only has uh, one and one and a half degree tilt, and so it's it's perfect, almost perfectly perpendicular to the direction of the sunlight, and that means that um, I'll show you later, but uh, that means that there are uh, craters at the North and South Pole that have not seen the sun for three billion years. And so they're absolute cold uh, darkness. And they've been collecting uh, ices all that time. So here's an uh, animation of uh, where you can actually start to see how the moon is really three-dimensional. It's rocking back and forth a little bit um, because its uh, rotation and the orbit are not exactly perfectly aligned. The orbit is slightly elliptical. And so this is over the past month, and it's coming up. That was a new moon, and then uh, just a few days, and now it's stopped right there. That's, that's the moon right now. So now I'd like to talk about uh, Apollo during those three years when humans were landing on the moon, that was almost 50 years ago. Uh, Apollo was a very complex system, uh, and it was all done with 1960s technology. And so uh, your, your watch has more computing power than the Apollo spacecraft. Uh, the, uh, uh, you had to, the, the way that they designed going to the moon was uh, to have a big rocket, uh, Launched the whole thing all at once. Uh, then uh, you had a, uh, a spacecraft that you rode in on the way to the moon, and a uh, and it turned around and attached to a, a landing spacecraft called the lunar module. So you could, uh, and then the only part that came back to Earth was this little gumdrop-shaped cone 
that was the uh, command module. Right back. So they separated out the functions of, of uh, coming back to Earth and uh, the function of, of landing on the space on the moon. And so the, the landing on the moon was this uh, thing that didn't have to be aerodynamic at all. It had all sorts of things sticking out because it never went through the atmosphere. It always uh, was just sitting, uh, just designed to operate in vacuum. And uh, the whole system was very complex. Uh, and you had, uh, uh, when you go out to the moon, basically you, you fly out and you sort of get in the way of the moon's orbit. The moon is coming along here, orbiting around, and you just pop yourself out in front and wait to, for the moon to run into you. And then, uh, uh, and if you time it just right, you can, uh, you can fire uh, jets and slow down and go into orbit around the moon. And then uh, the Apollo spacecraft, uh, two, two of the astronauts got into the lunar land lunar module and separated and went landing on the moon while the other astronauts stayed in orbit. Uh, okay. So here's the, uh, uh, this is uh, Apollo 15, I believe. Uh, with the uh, lunar module landing on the moon. And uh, at the later space, uh, lunar missions, they figured out how to fold up an electric uh, vehicle and stick it on the side. And so you, you could uh, unfold this electric uh, lunar rover and drive around on the surface of the moon. So these are the, there were, uh, there were six landings of Apollo. 11, uh, 12, 13 had a failure and had to swing around the moon and come back home. 14 landed, and then 15, 16, 17. And for a while they thought they could only land in this equatorial region, but then they, they figured out they could also go a little higher and lower on the, off the equator. And they started landing in the middle of mountains uh, instead of just on the flat plains. So here's the, uh, the 12 guys that walked on the moon, uh, although they were smart enough to keep their helmets on. But they didn't. <laughs> this, let's see if the audio, I'm not sure if the audio will work on this. <coughs> this is Apollo 17, the last moon I landed. So they have a, a film going out the window. Dropping from about a, about two kilometers high um, in, in about uh, 20 seconds. So you're, if you were doing this in an airplane, you'd be screaming the whole way. <laughs> Thank you. 
Or you can just be able to see the shadow. That little dot. going on, it, this is like sitting in the cockpit of a landing of, a, of an aircraft, and if you're a passenger, you probably wouldn't know about any of this, <laughs> but, uh, but it's just an incredible amount of systems that they're configuring. Another. 
So, but they, they always worried that the, the lunar rover would die and they would have to walk back. So they never went that far. And so uh, the farthest they went was you know about 10 kilometers. And so I, I centered it, this, this grid on uh, where we're located. So they, if they were in the rover, they never would have made it to Wellington uh, and, and, and Apollo. So they and really only had three really long ones. So some of the uh, since Apollo, um, uh, for one, this is just an amateur image uh, that is uh, real colors, but he stretched the colors uh, with uh, processing, so that you could you could see that there were slight variations in the colors of the of the lava fields in this uh, blue white titanium uh, Tycho crater down here. So one. Uh, uh, there's been several orbiters. Uh, one measured the, uh, the height of the, uh, the different parts of the moon. And uh, one thing that's surprising is that how, how, what a range of heights there are. Um, the, all this white area is about as high as Everest above the average surface, eight, eight kilometers. And then this area down here is almost at, uh, the same depth, eight kilometers deep. And so uh, there's no there's no water or, or uh, atmosphere to to that or surface water that uh, would cause erosion to, to give you these you know alter these features. So these are just frozen in time from when they were created by impact, uh, mostly three billion years ago. So there's this giant impact that's like the largest impact in the solar system. And the, the Chinese hope, it's on the far side of the moon, the Chinese hope to land a, a lander over here uh, in uh, two years. This is a, uh, a summary that just came out two weeks ago from uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, and I'll, I'll let it uh, play uh, illustrating some of the um, some of the data from, because the lunar, or, lunar reconnaissance orbiter has been a very sophisticated spacecraft that's been mapping the moon for almost 10 years now. And, uh, and this video was produced inside this uh, simulator system that you can access uh, from JPL. Uh, and that, um, if you go to this, uh, I, I included the links that are in the, if you go into this document, uh, you can find the, the simulator. Uh, this is a real important area for the, um, the deep, uh, dark craters that have been in shadow for three billion years. And so there's actually evidence for surface water in here. Um, but, it's, but it's a four kilometer deep crater. 